when the chips are down, the most powerful country in the world acts like a pitiful, helpless giant, then the forces of totalitarianism and anarchy will threaten free nations and free institutions throughout the world. Thank you. I've always wanted to do that. Okay. Yeah, I know, I know. For those of you watching on TV, don't change your channel. This, this is the Vietnam War course. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves while I get this ready. Um, and that's obviously our segue into our class on Richard E. Nixon, as Archie Bunker used to call him. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite things about Archie. Talked a little bit about uh, Nixon in Vietnam. It's actually the area which I think we've probably covered the least as historians. Um, America's knowledge, I think, of the early period as we've exhibited in this class is actually far more thorough. You can spend a great deal of time talking about uh, the American decisions leading up to intervention and taking over the war. You can talk at great length. Uh, we've done less of that on the war itself. Uh, but when it gets to Nixon, you generally go through it fairly quickly. Um, both because there are several key events that kind of can be, you know, identified in that period, and you can talk about them as we'll do Laos and Cambodia and the air war and the Christmas bombings and so forth. And also because as historians we know less about it. Um, you know, anybody who's familiar with Nixon knows about his, uh, you know, secrecy and uh, many of the problems involved in documents in the Nixon era. Uh, there have been lawsuits over getting stuff declassified and over uh, who actually owns this, whether the Nixon family does or whether the United States government does. So historians have only now really begun to study Richard Nixon. If you go into a, a library or even a, a library catalog on the web or, you know, on the computer, um, you know, for books uh, on LBJ in Vietnam or on the Tet Offensive or on military aspects of the war, you're going to have a list, you know, it's going to be huge. But when it comes to Nixon, it's actually going to be quite small. I mean, you could really count the number of books by historians about Nixon's years in Vietnam on, on a hand. It's, there's a lot less there. And I suspect in the coming years it'll be, you know, uh, covered far more thoroughly. So we're not really giving short shrift to Nixon. I mean, he was president for, you know, four years of the war, uh, four very critical years of the war. Uh, the, the fighting continued. Uh, almost as many Americans died in Vietnam in Nixon's four years as had in the previous, uh, you know, decade before that. So uh, Richard Nixon really is an integral uh, uh, individual, uh, an important individual in this period. But in terms of time, we won't talk about him as much just because there's not as much out there. And it's organized, I think, in a sense, a, a bit more easily. Um, I had talked last week just a little bit about Nixon. If, if you don't know what he looks like by now, we can show you a nice little picture of him. It was so it is inaugural. I should have worn a, a black suit and wingtips. Uh, you know, Nixon used to uh, stroll along the beach in San Clemente in his suit and wingtips. This was, you know, this is the way he loosened up. Uh, he also ate uh, cottage cheese with ketchup on it. That was his favorite snack, which I'm sure some psychologists could tell us means something. Uh, Nixon was also a Quaker, and I don't even want to go into that. So um, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, the Nixon years, how he maintained the Arvin. Uh, how he uh, would make, he and his, his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, would make overtures toward peace while at the same time actually finding ways to escalate and intensify the fighting. Um, we talked, uh, I briefly mentioned things like Operation Phoenix and the uh, uh, increased aid to Arvin and, and so forth. Um, Nixon's overall policy was called Vietnamization, and the idea behind Vietnamization was, of course, that the United States should find some way to wind down the war to Vietnamize it, to force the Vietnamese to take responsibility for it on their own. This runs counter to the idea of Americanization, which we mentioned in 1965 when the U.S. essentially takes over the war from the Vietnamese. Now, on a, on a, on a logical level, this is really kind of bizarre stuff, isn't it? Vietnamizing the Vietnamese war. It'd be like Texasizing Texas. You know, it's, it's real, it's strange. And it obviously speaks to a fundamental problem in the war. I think, you know, and, and historians debate this all the time. I mean, I, to me, you know, the, the decision to Vietnamize the war, which actually occurs prior to Nixon, I think I mentioned Creighton Abrams, takes over from Westmoreland. Um, and this is what the military had always wanted to do anyway. So, uh, but the decision to Vietnamize the Vietnam War really is, a, a, I think, a very a powerful admission of um, the difficulties, if not the impossibility, of really making a, a, a substantial difference there. Um, if you have to, you know, kind of force the people who you're there to save the country that you've created to be saved, if you're going to force them to fight for it, then 
you know, you've, you've kind of lost the game already. And I think Nixon, clearly Nixon and, and the people before Nixon, really were moving in that direction. Um, as I said before, that's why I titled this The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, it's because I, I would argue that in these years, the idea of winning, whatever that means, of actually preserving uh, a South Vietnamese state are secondary to uh, uh, destroying the enemy. We quoted uh, that CIA analyst, and, and there are other quotes like that, but I, you know, I'll say it again because I think it's really telling. And even though this is just this one analyst, William K., I think it really does speak to a much larger mindset in Washington, in the Pentagon, in the White House at the time. Remember, K. said, unless major military operations sap a substantial proportion of North Vietnam's national effort, a degree of industrial progress is likely to be achieved that may well become a more effective means of political penetration in neighboring countries than direct military intervention. Okay. Very candidly, he's saying that uh, we have to destroy North Vietnam to make reconstruction terribly difficult, if not impossible, because if they survive the war, if the North survives the war without major losses, major uh, uh, damage to the infrastructure, then it may be able to rebuild and thereby provide a model of development for other uh, nations in the area first and then abroad. It's what JFK, referring to Castro, once called the threat of a good example. The idea that an alternative system may actually succeed and then provide a model for other uh, uh, nations in that particular status to, to emulate rather than to choose a, a liberal capitalism. So um, this is, you know, the way I see the Nixon years, it's very contradictory. And Nixon himself, of course, was very contradictory. So you have Vietnamization, but at the same time you're Vietnamizing, you're actually expanding the war. And you do this especially in the neighboring countries of uh, Laos and Cambodia, which, uh, as we've said before, run uh, right next to Vietnam, Laos, a longer nation here uh, to the west, and then Cambodia, uh, southern and western. Okay? And the wars, I, we mentioned early on, had, had not been uh, confined only to Vietnam. There had been fighting in Laos and Cambodia for some time, but it really intensified. Um, remember, long ago we talked about America's so-called secret war, uh, and that term always struck me as very strange, a secret war. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I need it in this one or this one. This one, right? Okay. Uh, the secret war against the Path That Lao, which was the communist insurgents uh, group in, in Laos. Okay. Uh, oh, the secret, well, it's, it's, it always seems strange to me that when you're using B-52s and you're bombing areas to call something a secret war. It's not really a secret to the people who, who are being attacked. Um, but uh, the Johnson administration had begun intense fighting in Laos, as I pointed out, and in the Plain of Jars, this region uh, up here, um, uh, in five years, between 1964 and 69 alone, uh, the United States unleashed over 150,000 tons of bombs on the Plain of Jars, which was a path, path that Lao uh, a stronghold. One UN official said the intensity of the bombing was such that no organized life was possible in those villages. Um, so the air war has been going on in the Johnson years, and Nixon decided to uh, uh, intensify, to escalate that as well. Now this is when he's Vietnamizing the war, which implies that you're winding it down, and he is withdrawing American troops. By 1971, uh, Nixon takes office with uh, about 500,000 troops in country, by 1971, um, it's going to be down to about 150,000. So it's a fairly rapid de-escalation de of the war in terms of manpower. And this is quite uh, astute. It was very clever politically because it really was able to defang uh, protests at home a good deal. We will talk. I mean, actually, the two biggest protests occur in the first year of Nixon's administration. But after that, you start to see less and less anti-war activity because of Vietnamization, because more Americans are coming home, and also I think because the draft uh, system has changed from uh, uh, the system with deferments, uh, which we will talk about when we get to soldiers. It was fairly easy for somebody in college to get deferred or somebody who had connections to get a medical deferment uh, to a lottery system, which was based on birth dates. So uh, those two things I think really helped to contain the anti-war movement more than it had been. Um, uh, so Nixon is trying to Vietnamize war, but at the same time he expands it. And in February of 1971, uh, actually invades Laos. This is something called uh, Operation Dewey Canyon. Uh, 
or I think the technical number was Lamson 719, I believe. Okay, and this is an invasion of Laos. Now, Dewey Canyon was intended to showcase um, Vietnamization. It was intended to uh, uh, allow the Arvin to prove its mettle. The Arvin was uh, uh, told, uh, the, Arvin's pl the, the planning involved an Arvin attack on uh, the northern Ho Chi Minh Trail. Let me kind of get, oh, da, da. I click on that. Remember I said the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which isn't on the map. I couldn't find a good map of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but kind of runs along the interior here. Uh, the idea was to attack the northern portions of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which are in Laos, and um, cut off supplies moving southward to actually hit the Pavan, the northern army's troop encampments and supplies, and to disrupt uh, plans for Pavan offensives. And just kind of as a refresher, we have the Arvin, which is the southern army, and the, the Pavan, the People's Army of Vietnam which is the Northern Army. This is contrary to, for example, the, the NLF VC, which is the guerrilla force in the South. Pavan is a Northern Army. It's a straight, regular conventional army. Um, so this is the idea that the Arvin will strike uh, these uh, encampments and these supply lines along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and wipe out the Pavan. And it will be a great victory. And it will prove that Vietnamization is working, that the, the Arvin is able now to take over uh, the war from the Americans. Uh, however, uh, the president of the RVN, Nguyen Van Tu, who's now president, T-H-I-E-U, um, not unlike ZM or other leaders before him, was concerned about uh, uh, taking on too many casualties. So he had essentially told his commanders uh, not to get involved in any, you know, kind of uh, risky uh, actions, risky engagements. Um, and in addition to that, the Arvin uh, did not have a strong intelligence uh, apparatus. And while the Arvin was planning the attack, preparing for it, uh, it was ambushed by 40,000 uh, Pavan troops and suffered casualty rates of over 50%. Um, there were about 660 American helicopters flying support missions of those. 540 of 660, that's 80% uh, or so, uh, were damaged or destroyed. These are U.S. helicopters. Um, it was a fiasco. And the only way that the United States prevented uh, uh, an even worse outcome was by unleashing B-52s. There are photos here of B-52s, which, as you can see, are fairly sizable bombers, quite, quite big. This is a, uh, yeah. Those were the B-52Hs, I think. Right. I think so. Uh, Is there a difference between H's and I's? Or? I don't think there's an I yet. What's sure that. Is there something significant, though? Uh, they have a different configuration. They have shorter tails, and they, I think they have a different type of uh, armament in the tail gun. And they can also carry more bombs, I think. Confirmed. Roger. <laughs> um, only by uh, unleashing the B-52s and dropping 48,000 tons. Now, this is in February of 1971. This occurs within a period of literally days. You think 48,000 tons of bombs within a period of days uh, prevented a, an even more horrific rout. Uh, but it was absolutely a disaster. Um, it was supposed to show that Vietnamization worked, and it, of course, did the opposite. It proved that the southern uh, state, that the Arvin, really existed basically because of massive U.S. support. Uh, during, um, during Dewey Canyon, one U.S. soldier uh, commented on the enemy versus the Arvin. In very blunt language, the guy said, this is a U.S. soldier. The enemy was a tough, hard, dedicated fucking guy. And the Arvin didn't want to hear about fighting. It was la-la land. Every, every, every firefight that we got into, the Arvin broke, the Arvin fucking ran. Okay? Um, again, this is not empirical, statistical evidence, but if you read soldiers' uh, impressions of the war, this is not at all an uncommon uh, um, uh, opinion. Uh, I've talked to many soldiers myself, and uh, 
tends to be fairly commonplace that they did not uh, uh, really uh, tr place much trust in the Arvin as a, as a fighting uh, ally. Uh, Kissinger uh, put it in more subtle terms. He said, uh, as for the South Vietnamese, Laos exposed many of their lingering deficiencies. Uh, Arvin planning, the Southern Vietnamese planning, Kissinger said, was largely abstract. And Kissinger said uh, he doubted if uh, the South Vietnamese ever really understood what we were trying to accomplish. Okay? Uh, and again, that's, I mean, it, you kind of laugh about it, but it's also fairly damning, you know. It, it was, you create an invasion, an offensive, to showcase their capability to take over the war. And then, you know, you talk about their lingering deficiencies and say they didn't really understand if we, what we were trying to accomplish. I mean, you know, again, who's, uh, I think it indicates just, again, that w what we're dealing with is, is basically, a, you know, a suzerain uh, and an underling relationship. Uh, Kissinger said because the Laos invasion had failed, uh, it was likely that the U.S. would, quote, face another major military challenge in Vietnam. And, of course, he spoke the truth there. Um, even more than Laos, Cambodia was really critical to the war effort. And I'm actually taking these in inverse chronological order uh, because Cambodia, uh, I hate to say it was more important because if you're in Laos, if you're in the Plain of Jars, the, the war is pretty damn important there to you. But I think Cambodia clearly was more public and in terms of the way that the war was being uh, reported and sold at home, Cambodia had far more impact because Cambodia spills over into the United States in ways that the Laos invasion didn't. Uh, there were always protests during, du during Dewey Canyon. At, at the time of Dewey Canyon there were, uh, and in fact uh, later on we'll talk about American soldiers who come home and have Dewey Canyon 3, which is a, uh, a, uh, an anti-war activity. But, but Cambodia was something even more intense, more different than that. It had an enormous impact uh, on events in Indochina at home. Um, Events in Cambodia are fairly Byzantine, too. Uh, remember long ago when I was talking about Laos and Suvana Fuma and all these folks? Well, it's not dissimilar in Cambodia. The government of Cambodia is run by Prince Sihanouk. Uh, Sihanouk was trying his best to remain technically neutral. However, back, back to the map, um, Is Sihanoukville here? No. There's a port down here called Sihanoukville. It's great. You're the president. You can name, name a port after yourself. Um, so uh, Sihanouk was not preventing the Viet Cong from uh, violating Cambodian territory with supplies or receiving uh, apply, uh, supplies at Sihanoukville. So even though technically neutral, quite clearly the, United, the uh, Vietnamese, the, the Viet Cong, are using Cambodia for supplies. Uh, Nixon, uh, to put a stop to that, in March of 1969 authorizes Operation Menu. Operation Menu with raids, codenamed Breakfast, Lunch, Snack, and Dinner, uh, constituted the so-called secret war on Cambodia. Um, and as I said before, they were, they were secret to the media, but not secret to the Cambodians. Yeah, I think you had a question. I'm sorry. Um, in, in this period, uh, beginning in 1969, hundreds of thousands of tons of bombs are dropped on Cambodia, which, as you can see, is not a terribly large country, <coughs> the size of a small state in the United States. Um, the uh, uh, bombings of Cambodia did not uh, force Sihanouk to buckle under. And the Viet Cong continued to use Cambodia for supplies. So Nixon decided to go one step further. And uh, while Sihanouk was out of the country, I believe he was in China visiting uh, Mao Zedong, um, the U.S. helped install Lon Nol into power, okay, whose name is the same backwards and forwards, palindrome, which is pretty much the most you can say about Lon Nol. He was not an accomplished politician, but while uh, Sihanouk is gone in March of 1970. There's a coup, and Lon Nol takes over, and he's clearly America's candidate. And the first thing he does, his first official act, is to invite the Arvin to invade Cambodia to get rid of the VC and Pavan. So Lon Nol invites South Vietnam into Cambodia to get rid of the Pavan uh, Viet Cong forces there. Uh, Nixon 
decided to take this as an opportunity. He claimed that the uh, uh, headquarters of the Cosvin, which I've mentioned before, Central Office of South Vietnam, Nixon thinks that Cosvin is kind of like the Pentagon for the enemy, that they have this uh, area here which, um, <laughs> there's this area here which, uh, kind of like the nerve center of, um, of enemy activity. So Nixon uh, decides that uh, the United States will invade, he calls, he doesn't call it an invasion, he calls it an incursion of Cambodia in late April. This is uh, just a week after he withdrew another 150,000 troops from Indochina. Uh, Nixon believed that the uh, invasion of Cambodia would both, uh, you know, hit Cosvin headquarters, but also it would speak to our old issue of credibility to show the world he was tough. As I said before, Nixon often, you know, he and Kissinger often invoke the madman idea. Nixon's a madman. We don't know what he's going to do. You know, you better listen to him. You better negotiate, you, you know, because the guy's nuts. He may bomb. He may drop the atomic bomb. We can't tell you what he's going to do. It's kind of a game. It's a good cop, bad cop game that Kissinger and Nixon played. And Nixon quite, quite happily went along with it. And he played the role of, of the madman. And so the idea here is to, again, show the world that, you know, Nixon's a little off kilter. And you really better listen to him and you better deal with him or else you never know what's going to happen. So in uh, 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 late April, the United States invades Cambodia. And then on April 30th, Nixon goes on TV and makes a speech that I began uh, with here. If when the chips are down, the most powerful nation acts like a pitiful, helpless giant, then the forces of totalitarianism and anarchy will threaten free nations and free institutions throughout the world. This is, again, credibility. If, you know, the, that's Nixon's famous pitiful, helpless giant speech. I mean, one of his, you know, along with the checker speech and, you know, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore and I am not a crook, you know, one of... Uh, Nixon's most, you know, important uh, public addresses. This, uh, the period from 1945 on really is the age of Nixon. You know, we talk about individuals quite often, and I have trouble with the great man theory of history, but there, if there really is anyone who typifies America for 50 years, it's Richard, it's Richard Nixon from 45 to, to his death in 94. Uh, for half century, he really does lurk upon the scene. Question? Is that why Bart Simpson's good friend is Millhouse? Millhouse, of course it is. <sighs> <laughs> it's all a conspiracy. I mean, the Trilateral Commission is behind that, too. Yeah. Yes. Deconstructing. Yeah, it is. Of course. Um, <laughs> so uh, Nixon uh, invades Cambodia. At the same time, the air war continues between July of 1970 and February 71. The U.S. flew over 8,000 sorties. A sortie is a mission. Drop your payload, you come back. That's over 300 a day. Okay, we're dealing with a fairly small country. So if you can imagine 300 sorties, many B-52s in Operation Arc Light are also flying uh, Cambodia. Uh, 300 sorties a day. So you can well imagine. Were some of these planes uh, coming out of Thailand? Yeah. Uh, Thailand, uh, I think most of the B-52s are coming out of Thailand and Guam. And uh, carrier-based uh, aircraft too, but yeah, Thailand was, you know, it's, it's different too because the guys, you know, they're, they're flying missions, they're coming home and they're eating dinner and sleeping in their bed at night, so it's a lot different for the pilots and for the guys in the field, the grunts in the field, so it's a, it's a different kind of war at this point too. Um, the U.S. also, uh, I don't know, I don't have the figures, I've been looking for specific figures, but um, the U.S. takes pretty big losses in this period too because B-52s aren't cheap, so um, the enemy, you know, makes them pay the piper for it. This is you know, modern wars like the Gulf War, Kosovo, you don't really see that because damage to American uh, resources was fairly minimal. But Vietnam wasn't like that at all. So there, were, uh, there, were, there was a price to pay. A lot of POWs are taken toward the end of the war here, too, not in the Cambodian uh, uh, attacks, but later on in the north. Um, Cambodia had basically, the whole country had basically become a free fire zone, uh, but it didn't have much impact on the war itself. Um, the Viet Cong continued to use Cambodia... Uh, for supplies uh, as a, uh, you know, to find refugee there and whatnot. When the U.S. actually invaded, Cosvin was basically an abandoned shack. It was like an old, an old woodshed. You know, there, there was no Pentagon there. There was no nerve center. It was just it never really had existed in, in the way Nixon had envisioned it anyway. Now, what this also does, uh, and if any of you have ever seen the movie uh, The Killing Fields, 
uh, this has a huge impact internally on Cambodian uh, politics. Um, in, uh, in Cambodia, Lon Nol is now in charge. He has taken over, and Lon Nol is clearly a U.S. backed. Uh, he was often derided as a puppet. Because of the coup and the air war, which devastates Cambodia, um, and this is the Sidney Schonberg, William Shawcross argument. Uh, Schonberg was a reporter for the New York Times, uh, uh, won a Pulitzer Prize, and Shawcross wrote a book about um, Cam uh, Cambodia called Sideshow. But uh, basically, um, there was a group, a I don't hesitate to call them crazy, a crazy communist group called the Khmer Rouge, the Red Khmeres. Khmer is an ethnic group. And the Khmer Rouge had been fairly small and isolated. Sihanouk was fairly popular, and Sihanouk was able to kind of play off the various groups against each other. Um, once Sihanouk was out of the picture, Lon Nol was clearly identified with the Americans. He was not neutral. He could not pull off neutrality the way Sihanouk could. So the Khmer Rouge were able to exploit Lon Nol's relationship with the U.S. and the continued American attacks, and they become far more powerful. This is a communist insurgency, but they're really pretty much over the edge. The Khmer Rouge doesn't like Ho Chi Minh and the, and the, and the Vietnamese, for instance. Uh, their leader is a, a man named Salaf Sar, who goes by the, the nom de guerre of Pol Pot. And uh, he's up there with you know, Hitler as a, as a tyrant, as a, as a, a mass murderer in this century. Um, Pol Pot uh, instituted the famous killing fields, if you've ever seen the movie or read about them. Literally, mass graves with thousands of skulls in them. Uh, uh, Pol Pot wanted to go back to year zero and basically create an agrarian utopia in uh, Cambodia. Cambodia had a population of maybe 9 or 10 million at the time. Pol Pot may have killed as many as 2 million. I mean, uh, statistically, it's more than, than the Germans killed, if you, if you, you know, in terms of considering what a small base you're starting from to kill 2 million, uh, perhaps 20% of the country. I've seen estimates as high as a third. Uh, right now, there's a Yale University, a, a wonderful historian there named Ben Kiernan, who's doing a, something called the Cambodian Genocide Project, which is really kind of uh, uh, getting, getting at the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, there were essentially four groups targeted, uh, Buddhists, um, Vietnamese, uh, I can't remember the others, but there were, there were certain targets ethnically, um, educated people, if you spoke French, you would probably be killed. If you wore eyeglasses, you probably would be killed. You would probably be considered a collaborator. Uh, so this is not unlike, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Red Guard during the Cultural Revolution or like the Taliban in Afghanistan today. Real fundamentalists in, in that sense, not religious, but, but they have their own form of very bizarre agrarian. Uh, I guess they, their prototype would be Mao, although, you know, even Mao, Mao uh, and, and the Chinese uh, actually were harboring Sihanouk at the time. Sihanouk was found refuge in, in China. So, I mean, um, uh, actually, the, the only country that ever really, uh, uh, one of the great ironies, Pol Pot was actually championed by the United States. Uh, because after, uh, I'm getting way ahead of the game here, but uh, in 1978, Vietnam invaded Cambodia and overthrew Pol Pot. And uh, from that point on, both the presidencies of Carter and Reagan at the United Nations always voted that Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, should have the Cambodian seat at the United Nations. That's a great irony there. But uh, um, the American attacks in 70 and 71, I think, really helped unleash the Khmer Rouge, which is this bizarre, murderous, you know, bloody group. And they, they actually take over in 1975. They, they win the war there. And um, so the Cambodian people really are doubly cursed. They have to deal with the American air war and the Khmer Rouge uh, within a very short period of time. Yeah. Would you clarify what I think I just heard? Uh, after the killing fields or during that time, when Vietnam overthrows Pol Pot, we've got Reagan trying to seat him? Not in, to see, well, I'm Nations. getting way ahead of the game here. In 1970, Pol Pot wins in 75. The Khmer Rouge take over in 75, and they rename the country Kampuchea, and they move people out of the cities, and they institute this really violent killing program. You know, kill, in three years, they kill, you know, perhaps two million people. Um, in 1978, the Vietnamese, uh, for lots of reasons, invade Cambodia and overthrow Pol Pot. Pol Pot, uh, the, the Vietnamese and Cambodian communists never got along well. Um, so in 1978, the Vietnamese invade Cambodia. The U.S. denounces the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia. Uh, basically, they said it's Vietnamese imperialism. They're trying to take over Indochina. There's certainly an element of that to it, but at the same time, um, you know, it ended the killing. Uh, from that point on, um, 
the Carter administration and then Reagan and Al Haig, who was his first Secretary of State, um, always uh, maintained that Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, was the legitimate government because in 1978, uh, the Khmer Rouge seat at the United Nations was given to the new regime, which was considered a Vietnamese puppet regime. Uh, and so um, the United Nations, the United States, Reagan and Haig, claimed that actually the Khmer Rouge should have that seat at the UN. Yeah, it's, yeah, and what can you say about that? So, I mean, it, it, this is something that's still, I mean, and the situation in Cambodia is still going, going on today. I mean, there's actually the first period of, uh, I don't want to, you know, not necessarily peace, but uh, some stability there. I, I think uh, it's important to point out that that two million figure is, uh, <clears throat> About half of it comes from the uh, the bombing episode, starting in '70, and then some of it came after Pol Pot took control. You know, as it, you know, all yeah. that Chomsky and Herman's analysis <clears throat> that they did back in '77 uh, 7 and '78. But then the media uh, attributed it all to Pol Pot. Yeah. As part of their. You know, it's regular it's kind of real difficult when you see a mass grave or when you see bodies, you know, a whole village wiped out. Um, yeah, there's no question that the American uh, bombs, you know, especially B-52s, uh, killed a huge number of people. Um, you know, too often we get up in these, you know, kind of tallies and numbers games and, you know, if it was only a million, it's not so bad, but since it's two million, it's bad. And Pol Pot was, you know, a very, very evil person. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, but, you know, I, I would, again, I think like Shawcross and Shanberg pointed out, I, I think that the Khmer Rouge really was made possible by the American activity. Uh, actually, Sihanouk joined a coalition with the Khmer Rouge, which gave him credibility. Had Sihanouk not been overthrown, then he's probably able to continue to play these groups off against each other. But Sihanouk really was the only unifying figure in the whole country. And in fact, uh, he's brought back. Uh, he's still alive. He's in terrible shape. He's had a series of strokes and whatnot. Uh, but um, Sihanouk was brought back throughout the 80s and into the 90s as a unifying figure, really the only person capable of uniting Cambodians. But yeah, I mean, the numbers, I don't want to get too caught up in them. I mean, uh, uh, whether it was a million or two million, uh, whether the Americans or the Cambodians killed more, I think, you know, both sides are, are fairly equally vile. Uh, and, you know, I don't, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. It's really easy to condemn and be horrified by uh, <clears throat> the Khmer Rouge, you know, killing a, a thousand people and dumping their skulls into a mass grave. And we don't have the same uh, um, response when in an airplane kills a whole village, you know, I, it's not direct, I don't know, it's just the way I mean, humans tend to look at things, I guess, so, but, uh, yeah, in terms of the numbers, uh, both, both were, were repugnant and, and horrific. Um, also unleashes uh, the most intense protest of the war at home, too. Uh, the war really came home in ways that it never had. Uh, some of the chronology here is kind of up and down, but that's okay, you'll, I think you'll be able to follow it, we're all kind of uh, uh, aware of what's happening here. Um, the war really comes home in May of 1970. Nixon, remember, gives his speech um, on the 30th <clears throat> of April. And um, as Nixon prepared his speech, he knew that basically the stuff was going to hit the fan. Um, as he was preparing this pitiful, helpless giant speech, he was talking to his daughter, Julie, who was a senior that year graduating at Smith College. And he said, it's possible that the campuses are really going to blow up after this speech. Uh, Nixon had been telling people the war was winding down. Um, I'll get to it later, but in 1969, in the fall, there are two major anti-war actions, the, the mobilization to end the war and the moratorium, very mainstream actions. Millions of people participate. And so the movement thinks that it's actually succeeding in uh, uh, containing the war. Nixon is Vietnamizing. As I said, he announced the withdrawal of another 150,000 troops. And then, boom, all of a sudden, he invades Cambodia when people were finally starting to see, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel or, you know, that, that America had turned the corner, that the war might end soon. And Nixon instead escalates it. He widens it. He geographically expands it to Cambodia now. And so Nixon, when he said that uh, it's possible the campuses are going to blow up, knew of what he spoke because they did. Ironically, uh, a large number of Americans supported the invasions of Cambodia. Probably a majority of Americans uh, supported the so-called incursion, uh, and again, because it gave the impression that Nixon was doing something. Uh, however, uh, universities and colleges, from junior colleges to you know, major uh, elite uh, universities, uh, erupted in protest. Um, of, uh, there were uh, major demonstrations on over 1,300 campuses nationwide. Um, 
536 campuses were shut down completely for a time and 51 campuses closed for the remainder of the uh, spring semester in California, which was the nation's largest uh, public uh, system of higher education. The governor, Ronald Reagan, shut down the entire state university structure and the same thing happened in Pennsylvania. Um, of course, the war came home most vividly uh, at Kent State in Ohio and at Jackson State in Mississippi. Uh, Kent State is a working class school in northeastern Ohio. I grew up uh, not far from there, in a small town about 45 minutes away from Kent. Uh, Kent is where kind of first generation college students, steel workers, kids often went to school. <clears throat> um, it was a working class place, uh, commuter school. Um, students had begun organizing demonstrations there right after Nixon's speech. And in particular, they were targeting the ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Corps, building throughout the country ROTC uh, installations were particular targets because they were training men in military arts and they were seen as kind of a function of the military industrial university complex, the multiversity. And so ROTC uh, cadets, uh, ROTC enrollments went down dramatically in the, in the 60s and 70s. A lot of schools, Ohio State, for example, used to be um, compulsory compulsory ROTC for freshmen, a lot of them started to drop that because uh, cadets themselves were being harassed and, and hassled and the buildings were often being uh, you know, targeted for protest and whatnot. Uh, and this wasn't uh, any different in Kent. On May 2nd, in fact, uh, a fire, uh, almost unquestionably arson, uh, uh, was set at the ROTC building and torched it. Um, at that point, things get real, uh, real ugly. Um, the governor of Ohio is a man named James Rhodes, who was governor forever. I, growing up, I mean, Rhodes was always governor. He was a Republican, very conservative Republican. In 1970, May of 1970, um, James Rhodes is running for Senate against uh, Robert Taft from the old Republican family. This is in the Republican primary. And Rhodes was actually far behind Taft. And Rhodes decided essentially to uh, uh, kind of play heavy at Kent so Rhodes compares the students at Kent State to the Nazis, to communists, and to the Ku Klux Klan. And he really kind of unleashes on them. He decides to send the National Guard to Kent State. The National Guard, just a week before that, had been in Xenia, Ohio. It's, you have the misfortune of having somebody from this area talk about it, so you're getting more detail than you ever wanted. Uh, Xenia, Ohio, had been the site of a, a killer tornado, like a, just one of the worst tornadoes in American history, several people killed. So the National Guard had been in Xenia doing cleanup and whatnot. So these people are taken from Xenia and sent to Kent. They're tired, they're overworked, and they're not terribly well trained. I mean, these are weekend warriors. They haven't been trained in, in riot control to any really effective degree. Um, on May 4th, just a few days after the speech, uh, amid these protests, right, a couple days, just a couple days after the burning of the ROTC building, uh, students and, and the guardsmen really got into it. Students had been kind of hassling the guard throughout this whole period, pitching stuff at them. And there was, there was a, a fairly significant space in between them, several hundred yards, actually. Uh, the students were throwing, I mean, bottles and rocks and whatnot. Uh, nothing, I don't think, uh, no serious damage done to the National Guardsmen. A couple were kind of hit, but, but nothing serious. Uh, finally, however, the guard had had enough. It's kind of like the Boston Massacre. The taunting had become too great, and they, they let loose, and they fired on the students. They opened fire, killing four and wounding 13 others. Um, actually, one, if at least one, and maybe two of the people killed were not students at Kent State. They were kind of town people or who were, who were around at the time. Uh, Nixon, just a few days uh, before that, had said that these student protest protesters were bums blowing up the campuses. So he offers no sympathy to the students at Kent. And in fact, many people were uh, very supportive of the National Guard. Uh, Vice President Spiro Agnew said that the killings were predictable and that the people demonstrating were part of, quote, the psychotic and criminal element of our society. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, FBI director and cross-dresser extraordinaire, told White House officials that one of the young women killed, quote, was nothing more than a whore anyway. Okay, so this is the way the Nixon Kissinger White House responded to the killings at Kent. But um, many Americans took that differently. Uh, campuses had always been something of a sanctuary. Uh, these are people uh, our age. I mean, actually, they're much younger than us as I look around the room here. 
Uh, these are, you know, 19, 20 year old kids going to college and all of a sudden they're involved in, in actual shootings on campus. Uh, and this startles America. I mean, protests and demonstrations. Chicago, you could kind of write that off. Chicago was a unique situation. They were hippies and whatnot. But these are college kids at a basically, you know, working class state institution. And um, it really broke the sense of, of innocence. Uh, in a sense, the 60s kind of ended Kent State if they hadn't already. I mean, they probably, you know, after Kennedy and King killings in 68, there's not much of that idealism and hope left. But uh, once kids on campuses are being shot at, once you have these pitch battles, it really startles people. Uh, a lot of protesters are terrified. I mean, it's the real deal now. You're, you know, it's more than just the possibility of getting suspended or, you know, whatever now. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's gunfire on the campuses. So um, a lot of parents are terrified. I mean, a lot of parents all over just grab their kids and take them home. You know, so you're, you're coming home. Uh, a lot of schools, as I said, shut down. Um, this really galvanized college students throughout the country. Uh, with almost no planning, uh, 100,000 people show up on May 9th. I mean, 100,000 people within, you know, just boom, spontaneously show up in D.C. And this is when uh, Nixon, uh, deciding to show that he's hip with the kids, he's down with the kids, uh, wakes up his uh, chauffeur at like 2 a.m. and says, take me to the mall where a bunch of these kids are camped out. And he wants to show that he can, he can rap with the kids. He's, he's down with the kids. He's hip. Uh, and so he goes over there. And these kids are there to protest, you know, the war killings at Kent State, and Nixon wants to talk about football with them. You know, how do you think the Redskins are going to do this year, that kind of thing. One student said he just kept rambling and he didn't make any sense. Uh, it didn't do anything to bring calm to the country either, and just in fact a few days after that at Jackson State University, which is a historically black college in Mississippi, which is probably the reason we hear a lot more about Kent than Jackson, uh, there were protests there as well. A National Guardsman attacked a dorm and killed two students. So by uh, May of 1970, the U.S. is in a wider war in Cambodia, and also there is violence being used against students at home by the state. So it's an incredibly frightening time. A, a good friend of mine was a student at Ohio State at the time, and basically Ohio State shut down if, uh, High Street is the main drag near campus, just full of shops, and the university is on one side, and shops and all kinds of stuff, coffee houses, and record stores on the other side, a very long, big street, and High Street was just filled with students. And in fact, uh, Woody Hayes, the famous football coach at Ohio State, was uh, dashing out there because a lot of his football players were out there protesting the war. And Woody Hayes is yelling to everybody, go home, you're going to get hurt, and he's grabbing, trying to grab his football players and get them back to safety and whatnot. Uh, I mean, people thought it was the revolution, you know, college students. Uh, incredibly hectic time, and you can read accounts of this uh, on every major campus. Uh, Ohio State went on a general strike. The graduate students all went on strike. And again, that was not untypical either of, of the Kent State response. Uh, universities all were just shut down. They went on strike. Uh, parents yanking their kids home. I mean, the war had really come home in ways that it never had before, uh, even more than Chicago in 1968. Um, so Nixon's peace with honor, Nixon's Vietnamization seemed as far away as ever uh, at that point. Okay. Um, but at the same time, uh, Nixon and, and Kissinger um, are also involved in negotiations to end the war. And the kind of uh, little uh, riff that they would often use was that peace was at hand. And they would kind of play on this time and again. The major negotiators were, uh, for the U.S. side, Henry Kissinger. Right there, you've probably all seen him. Uh, it's a, a, a little uh, personal uh, it's kind of an anecdote, which is going to be kind of fun. Uh, in the coming months, Henry Kissinger is going to give a talk at UT in early 2000, and uh, they've invited me to come up and give the contra Kissinger, the anti Kissinger talk the night before. So it's going to be fun. Uh, so it'd be a little bit different, my version of events with Henry. And I'm also making a lot less than him. He's making 100,000, I'm making nothing. <laughs> so maybe we could just split the difference and each get 50, right? I, I think he'd go for that. <laughs> Um, UT is shelling out 100 grand. I think so. That's the, the going rate. Business yeah. community. These guys Paying make big, Kissinger, I think, is the highest paid public speaker in America. Uh huh. It's also a Nobel Prize winner. So that would do it. Are we going to come back to the anti war movement? I yeah. noticed on your Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's there. It's actually next, yeah, after this. Um, as I said, Nixon's kind of all over the place. And on one hand, he's claiming to Vietnamize the war. Good question? I just 
thought it might that, that it was good that you put the Nixon mask on at the <laughs> beginning of the class yeah. because after this lecture it, it could have been serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, on one hand, he's Vietnamizing the war. He's he's talking about bringing soldiers home, but on the other hand, he's expanding it into Cambodia, into Laos. As we'll see, he's also intensifying the air war, and he's also talking. Okay, he's negotiating. But even these negotiations are very, very strange in that they're you know um, kind of underhanded and backstabbing and whatnot. Very, very Nixonian and Kissinger-esque. Um, <laughs> the Johnson and Nixon administrations really had not made much of an effort to negotiate an end to the war. Uh, this is another aspect of the war that I really haven't mentioned and um, you don't get too much about in the traditional histories of the war. Uh, th there were overtures. I mean, there were basically peace feelers sent out at various times. Um, off uh, For a while, um, the U.S. was working through uh, Polish intermediaries who were talking to the Vietnamese. And, um, you know, LBJ in 1967 makes a speech at San Antonio called the San Antonio Formula where he basically offers negotiations in return for, uh, uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh to stop support of the VC in the South, which they're never going to accept. But, you know, basically we can, we can run through it fairly quickly because I don't think there were really any serious efforts to, to negotiate. Uh, on the American side, they really weren't there, and, and Ho's overtures... Um, were fairly half-hearted for a couple of reasons. Remember when we talked about the Chinese involvement? I mean, the Chinese were trying to prevent Ho from negotiating. The, the Soviet Union wanted negotiations. And in addition to that, I mean, Ho was basically winning the war. So there's a lot less of ince incentive to talk when you have the upper hand. Uh, so there really aren't many serious efforts um, for a peace treaty. Uh, basically, when the U.S. does make overtures, uh, one of its main conditions is that the NLF is not allowed to participate in negotiations. And, of course, I mean, you know, that's going to kill anything. That's a, that's a deal breaker. How can you negotiate without the NLF? I mean, that's, that's the southern representative. That's the southern enemy. And, you know, the NLF would never agree to that, and Ho Chi Minh would never agree to that. So they weren't real sincere efforts. Um, in fact, uh, there were – actually, there was one occasion when talks seemed to – have some potential, but Nixon and Kissinger torpedoed them. It's a bit off the path, but it's a great story. Um, in uh, October, October of 1968, Nixon is running for president against Hubert Humphrey. And Nixon has a fairly good lead, but Humphrey starts to chip away with it when finally LBJ uh, decides that he will have negotiations for peace. Up to this point, uh, Johnson did nothing to help Humphrey during the 68 election. He was basically making it as difficult as possible for Humphrey, and Humphrey was being very loyal and refusing to disavow Johnson. Well, finally, in late October, John Johnson, to make a long story short, announces that uh, peace negotiations are possible. At this point, uh, Humphrey starts to move up in the polls fairly rapidly, and he's getting close to Nixon. Henry Kissinger, who is not really a Nixon crony yet, he had actually worked with Nelson Rockefeller, and Kissinger had worked with both Democrats and Republicans, uh, Nixon gets Kissinger at that point, and they're worried that if these peace talks succeed, Humphrey will win the election. He'll pull over, pull through at the last minute and win a, a close one. So Nixon and Kissinger, working through Madame Claire Chenault, whose husband, General B. Chenault, had formed the uh, Flying Tigers in World War II. Uh, Chenault was a close friend of Nguyen Van Tu, the president of South Vietnam. So Kissinger, working through Claire Chenault, had basically sent a back-channel message to two saying, don't negotiate. We'll give you a better deal. Don't let Johnson swindle you. If you hold out and kill these talks, we'll win the election and we'll take care of you. Uh, this is an October surprise. You know, we've heard a lot about the 1980 October surprise where allegedly Bush told the Iranians not to release the hostages before the election because they'd get a better deal. People are like, oh, that could never happen. Well, that's exactly what happened in 1968. I don't know if Bush did it or not, but. Um, that's exactly what happened in 1968. Uh, Kissinger, working through Chenault, talked to two. Two gutted the talks and Humphrey's momentum. I mean, if you look at the polls, he's steadily going up, then boom. All of a sudden, Nguyen Van Tu announces that he will not negotiate, and, and Humphrey's momentum is stopped dead, and Nixon wins a close election. That was probably the, the closest to realistic peace talks uh, uh, that the Americans had come prior to this time. In 1970, however, um, Kissinger begins back-channel talks. Uh, 
with Le Doc Tho, uh, the Vietnamese representative, the two uh, uh, individuals I just showed you. This is ironic because at the time people always think Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State. In fact, he wasn't. He was National Security Advisor. The Secretary of State was a man named William Rogers. Rogers was kept totally out of the loop. Nixon was really kind of contemptuous of William Rogers. And in fact, Kissinger began peace talks with Le Doc Tho, and Rogers didn't even know about it. The Secretary of State was not even informed about this. He found out through the back channel like everybody else did. Um, on the major issues involving negotiations, though, both sides were far apart. Far apart. Uh, the Vietnamese wanted a bombing halt. They wanted the U.S. to quit bombing. They wanted the National Liberation Front to have a political role in the South. And they wanted the U.S. to quit supporting the RVN, the Southern Vietnamese. And so, of course, the U.S. wouldn't go for any of those. And for its part, the Americans wanted Ho Chi Minh to quit supporting the NLF in the South. And they wanted the NLF to be excluded from negotiations. And, of course, the Vietnamese weren't going to go for those. Others. So they're very far apart. Um, and, in fact, in June of 1970, after Nixon invades Cambodia, Le Duc Tho, to protest that invasion, breaks off talks altogether. Um, they reopen a year later, in May of 71, and um, in order to get public opinion behind them, to get the diplomatic initiative, uh, the enemy, uh, which it always gets more confusing, uh, the enemy is now called the PRG. This is essentially the NLF. PLG, PRG stands for Provisional Revolutionary Government. If you ever see that, that's the NLF. It's the same people. Okay. So if I say NLF, if I say PRG, I'm talking about the same group. I got a question. Um, in in, 19, in, in uh, July of 71, both Hanoi and the PRG, the PRG is also southern, keep that in mind. So when I talk about Hanoi, I'm talking about the communist leadership in the north. Uh, Hanoi, the communist leadership in the north, and the PRG announced a peace proposal which included a coalition government in the south. Okay a government which included both current leaders and NLF leaders, um, the withdrawal of American troops and the return of POWs from all sides. So this was the enemy's proposal, including a coalition government, all right, which was a huge step from where they had been before, where they had basically been demanding that the U.S. quit supporting the RVN altogether and that the, PR, the NLF essentially take over. Um, Hanoi uh, also suggested free elections in the South, which they believed were important um, because uh, uh, they figured they would win. Just as in 1954, they favored free elections because they figured they would win. Um, they also figured, well, and by winning here, it's not necessarily that a communist would be elected. What they figured was that any elections in the South would uh, result in a government that would be willing to negotiate an end to the war. And just like Ho in 1954, they still figured that over time they could peacefully take over the country if the U.S. were out of the picture altogether. So they considered conti continue to uh, 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 think this way. Right? Kissinger um, rejected that. Kissinger told the media that Hanoi was demanding the overthrow of the two government. I mean, this was not the case at all, but the media swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. Kissinger really was able to seduce the media, uh, if you remember that time at all, or if you go back and read, uh, like Seymour Hersh, which is the best book on Kissinger. But, but basically anything, Kissinger really was masterful with the media. I mean, he could tell them that, you know, it was, uh, you know, uh, snowing in Texas, and they'd believe him. You know, he was just, the, the media just kind of swallowed him hook, line, and sinker. So when he interpreted the proposal that, you know, they were demanding the two be gone, oh, that wasn't the case at all. The, the media bought it. Um, Kissinger said that free elections in the South were a source of turmoil and uncertainty. Free elections are a source of turmoil and uncertainty, so the U.S. would be opposed to that, okay? So this is where the peace talks stand in 1971, yeah. Wasn't there some controversy about the Buddhist element in South Vietnam also wanting a seat at the peace talks and being denied that seat? Yeah, although didn't that Martin, was... Didn't Martin Luther King nominate... Uh, yeah, that monk. Thich Nhat Hanh. For, yeah, who's uh, still around. He's still in the U.S., isn't he? I think he's still in the U.S. He lives in France. Oh, he's in France now? Okay, he was in the U.S. for a while. Uh, he's still around. Yeah, um, that was less politically possible, I think. Uh, there was no real, nobody really standing up for the Buddhists, so to speak. So, I mean, you know, whereas 
the other sides kind of have weapons behind them to get them a seat at the table. The Buddhists, yeah, don't. I mean, there's a great deal of talk about what kind of government there had been. And another thing I don't talk about much is there had been elections in Vietnam. Nguyen Van Tu always won. Uh, basically, there were a couple times when Tu uh, was running against uh, front candidates who were going to defeat him. And so these, these elections were always rigged in the South. Uh, and the Buddhists were always part of the National Front. And, you know, one of their main platforms is, yeah, we're going to negotiate. We're going to get this thing over with. This is killing us all. And the U.S., you know, was always afraid that peace might break out. So really helped stage these elections uh, uh, that would uh, return Nguyen Van Tu uh, to power. Uh, I mean, there was never anything like a, a free election in the South. Uh, no elections in the North either, for that matter. Um, you're not dealing with democracy here. And, you know, to talk about it in those terms like Nixon and, and Johnson before him had done was really a, a public relations uh, um, maneuver, you know, freedom and democracy and all that stuff. It was, it was never sincere. So th this is the initial attempt at negotiations, which is really getting nowhere. Um, however, uh, both sides realize that negotiations have to go hand in hand with continued warfare. And so that occurs, too, throughout this period. As I said, um, 1969 and 70 were kind of like the low points for the enemy. The second and third Tet Offensives and then Operation Phoenix had really taken their toll on the Vietnamese. And read Neil Vinh Long's article on this. This is good for this, too. So uh, really, the enemy spent 69 and 70 basically regrouping. Uh, but within a year and a half, two years, they're pretty much back on their feet. And this is where I think Neil Vinh Long is really, uh, uh, really powerful because it really shows stuff that other people hadn't seen before. But by 1970-71, the VC is starting to resume their infiltration of the countryside to disrupt pacification programs and to get a foothold once more. A lot of these VC are now from the north. They're, recruit, they're uh, infiltrators from the north rather than southern recruit recruitees. They may not be quite as effective. They may not know the area quite as well, but they're still pretty good. And again, according to most uh, impressionistic accounts I've read, they're still better than the Arvin. And that seems to be a constant uh, throughout this period. Um, so uh, um, because negotiations weren't working terribly well, the war is going on, um, you start to see kind of intensified action throughout 1971 and 72 as the enemy recovers. And to kind of jump ahead a bit, it reaches a new intensity in 1972. Uh, 72 is a weird year, and I don't want to kind of go off on a, on a long soliloquy about it, but Nixon in 1972 had really uh, very cleverly uh, increased his options in Vietnam in ways that LBJ never could have by uh, pursuing a detente with the other two great communist powers, the uh, Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. All right? Detente is a French term, an accommodation, getting along with, a cooperation. Um, Nixon had made overtures to, to the Soviet Union and to China. In 1972, this is the famous ping-pong diplomacy, which culminates in visits. Uh, I mean, Nixon and Kissinger actually visit uh, Beijing, where Nixon utters those famous words, it is indeed a great wall. Uh, and uh, goes to the Soviet Union as well. Uh, Brezhnev and Nixon begin uh, 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 arms limitation talks. Um, what Nixon has done is essentially isolate the, so the uh, Vietnamese now. Um, all three major powers, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China, uh, see Vietnam as, as a secondary consideration. Their own interest and their own desire for some kind of rapprochement is far greater than Vietnam. So there's no way that China and the Soviet Union are going to lose an opportunity at detente because of Vietnam. That just doesn't matter. Vietnam's not that important to them. So Nixon now has essentially isolated Vietnam through this policy of detente. He even travels to the PRC in 1972, opens arms talks, as I said. So um, now you have Vietnam understandably isolated. Ho, uh, not Ho Chi Minh, Pham Von Dong succeeds Ho, who dies in uh, 1969. Pham uh, Von Dong understands this. This is a, a whole new ball game. And in fact, at Russian, it was, it was really uh, more the, at Russian pressure than Chinese that Ho had even entered peace talks. Uh, he had always been wary of it. The Chinese had been trying to keep him out of peace talks. And in fact, it was the Soviet Union which saw the war just destroying everything in 1968, which was kind of urging Ho to do it. It was ultimately Ho's call. It wasn't because of uh, uh, the Soviet Union, but clearly the Soviet Union had favored 
peace negotiations. But by 72, the Soviet Union, too, had uh, been willing, of course, to see its own interest ahead of those of Vietnam. Everybody does that. That's not surprising. What that does for Nixon, though, is give him opportunities that LBJ never had. Because LBJ constantly was worried about China or the Soviet Union coming in. He would always say that quite candidly. What if they bring in volunteers? There's 100,000 Chinese advisors in the North. What if we hit uh, uh, a uh, Soviet uh, um, supply ship uh, at Haiphong um, up here? Uh, one of the major ports in Vietnam is at Haiphong, Haiphong Harbor. And this is where a lot of Soviet commercial freighters would come in with oil and with other kinds of goods. And, uh, um, you know, Nixon was always, a, a, you know, Johnson was always leery of, uh, you know, they used to say, let's mine Haiphong Harbor. Well, what if you blow up a Russian ship? Is it worth it? Uh, what if you, you shoot down a Russian plane? What if you violate Chinese airspace? So there's a great deal of fear there that LBJ has to, has to understand, has to be aware of, and he's constrained by it. Nixon, however, doesn't have that same fear of Chinese or Soviet escalation uh, that had influenced LBJ. So what he can do is essentially fight a war uh, without constraints. You know, kind of the bugaboo in the 20 years uh, after the war has ended was that the U.S. had to fight with one hand tied behind its back. And we can debate that and argue about it, you know, ad nauseum. But in fact, Nixon really wasn't fighting with hands tied behind his back because he did not have the same constraints that LBJ did. As a result, he begins to attack North Vietnam, the air war, which had always been uh, focused mostly, I, I don't have parallels on this, on an area around the 20th parallel and below, uh, and then had expanded out from there, really now is almost unhindered. Um, except for a small area around Hanoi of about 10 miles, Nixon is essentially basically bombing all of, all of North Vietnam. Um, he also unleashes a B-52 campaign, a new B-52 campaign in 1972, and this coincided with the so-called Easter Offensive. Okay, And this is actually just the same picture that I showed you before of the B-52s. What's the Easter Offensive? Uh, this is another one of the controversial uh, battles. There weren't many set-piece battles in Vietnam. It's like World War II where you can, you know, kind of target the war according to major battles. Uh, Sicily and uh, the invasion of uh, France before that, or, uh, you know, D-Day, Normandy. Uh, Vietnam's not really like that. You have Ye Drong and, you know, a couple operations. Uh, Tet, which really isn't a battle. And the Easter Offensive. I mean, it's not, it's hard otherwise to kind of trace it in these terms. You, you can't do a conventional military history of Vietnam. It's, well, you could, but it's just a lot, different, a lot different and a lot more difficult, I think. But the Easter Offensive is really kind of maybe the, the prototype. It's the one, I think, more than anything, set piece, kind of more traditional battle in, in the whole war. I would say even more than Ye Drong in 65. This began uh, at Easter, 1972, March 30th. Um, Pavin had been, Pavin, which is the conventional army in the north, had been preparing for an invasion for some time. And they had been preparing off in Laos. And it's funny because American and Arvin intelligence kind of thought something was going on. They saw these bulldozers and heavy construction and whatnot. And there was something going on, but no one could really quite figure it out. It's kind of like a Pearl Harbor or Battle of the Bulge. You know, something's happening, but we're not exactly sure what it is. So, um, actually, beginning in 1971, the Pavin had been constructing, uh, uh, the expanding the Ho Chi Minh Trail, building um, military uh, installations, and undergoing military preparations. And these essentially are occurring, actually, I'm way north, uh, um, uh, around here as well, down in this area near, uh, near Tukor, uh, near Kontum, and in the Central Highlands. Uh, and as I said, the intelligence kind of senses that something is happening here, but they're not really sure where. Uh, in that area, uh, three Pavan divisions, which have uh, artillery associated with them and uh, Soviet tanks, T-54 tanks. I don't have a, a photo of one. Uh, at that point, um, after preparation on March 30th, they had um, I was swept across, they're kind of up around here, as I said, where these countries, near, near where these countries meet in this area. They sweep across the 17th parallel. The Pavin actually intervenes. So if this is the 17th, you actually have a Pavin invasion, and especially in two core, two core tactical zone, which is in the Central Highlands area. 
and I'll mention this in, 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 in a short while. Um, Hanoi was trying to show the failure of Vietnamization and basically to tell Nixon that um, we're not going to quit. You face the prospects of endless war. Uh, and they basically met the first one fairly easy. Vietnamization, again, just as it had in Dewey Canyon in the Laos invasion, uh, was shown to be a failure. The Arvin basically crashed. And the Pavan and VC began to capture a lot of cities in the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, as well as all of Quang Tri province. The VC actually, you know, put up a flag. I mean, the Pavan, you know, it's actually enemy flag was flying over. It was liberated province, as they called it, in Quang Tri, which is just below the, uh, the 17th parallel. Crate and Abrams, as I said, he had replaced Westmoreland. He was the American commander in Vietnam, feared that the Arvin have lost their will to fight and that the whole thing may well be lost. Uh, the Arvin was suffering over 20,000 desertions a month and had casualty figures for that year already of about 150,000. You know, um, if the Vietnamese had to build walls like the U.S. wall, they would have 20 or 30 of them. They, they lost, you know, huge numbers. So uh, 150,000 uh, Arvin dead that year alone. And uh, during the Easter offensive, the Arvin essentially uh, was on its heels the whole time in retreat and deserting in large numbers. So uh, really, within days, um, the offensive goes from Quang Tri all the way down here to Con Tum. And uh, basically, the Vietnamese, the Pavan, was surprised by its own success, the speed of its own success, and it outran its own supply lines. Uh, they stopped in Con Tum. Um, they, they basically had a clear path toward uh, the northeast uh, had they chose to uh, uh, go in that direction. Uh, but um, really were kind of stymied. They were shocked by their own success. Uh, they were surprised by the speed of the offensive, and they hesitated. Uh, that hesitation really uh, uh, prevented uh, uh, an even more impressive offensive. In the meantime, Nixon rallied. Uh, he said he would not negotiate and told Kissinger, no nonsense, no niceness, no accommodations. He orders a new s series of air attacks. Uh, this will be called Operation Linebacker. This is in, in April of 72, Operation Linebacker, the Air Force begins nonstop B-52 attacks north of the uh, 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 17th parallel. Nixon says, those bastards have never been bombed like they're going to be bombed this time. Um, in a three-week period, in April of 72, uh, under the supervision of an American civilian, John Paul Van, uh, I mentioned Van before, he had uh, uh, left the military uh, and had come back uh, basically with the status of a general, but as a civilian pacification officer. Uh, Van essentially takes control of the situation from the Arvin. Van never had a good relationship with the Arvin, never thought highly of them, to put it mildly. And Van takes control of the situation and calls in the B-52s. In a three-week period, in Contum alone, there are over 700 B-52 sorties. I'm sorry, B-52, 700 in the DR Van, 300 in Contum alone. And daily on Quang Tri province, 40 B-52 sorties. Okay, this goes on for about a three-week period. And each sortie has over 30 tons of bombs in it. So this is truly intense warfare. I mean, uh, you know, Quang uh, Tri province, which is very small, uh, daily is hit by um, uh, 40 B-52 sorties of 30 tons each. Nixon began bombing Hanoi and mined the port at Hai Phong, uh, the, the port, the, the harbor at Hai Phong, okay, in May. This unleashed another round of protest. This was by far the most aggressive action any American official had taken, but Nixon could get away with it, basically because even though the Chinese and the Soviet Union would complain and protest, they had put their fortunes had staked their fortunes to detente, and they weren't going to risk that over Vietnam, which was not an area that important to them. By the time the Easter Offensive had run its course in May of 72, the B-52s had prevented the RVN for, from collapsing, but there was a great deal of damage done. Uh, there is a great deal of debate among military historians over uh, 
what the Easter offensive did, what it meant, who won, who lost. Uh, and I think the official line is that the Easter offensive was a, a victory for the American military. Uh, most of the official reports tend to put it in those terms. Um, however, the damage was quite severe. The Arvin had suffered huge losses and thousands and thousands of desertions. The attacks created over a million more refugees. I mentioned the refugee problem last week, and that's something that we don't talk enough about. It's critically important. Uh, when a city, uh, the capital city Saigon, sees its population quadruple, then you have a serious problem on your hands. Uh, uh, what did you say last week? That it would be the equivalent of 120 million refugees in the United States, all right? So, I mean, if you can imagine 120 million refugees flooding into, uh, you know, Washington, D.C., uh, I think of that, and this is what Saigon is experiencing, and the Easter offensive causes a million more because people flee the Central Highlands, they flee, and everybody heads down further and further to Saigon, which is, of course, the capital city, and it's far to the south, the area one would think least likely to be invaded and attacked by uh, uh, the Pavan. Um, the NLF, after the Easter offensive, remained in control of northern Quang Tri province. Guerrilla forces had reestablished positions all along the coast and in the delta. So once again, the VC controlled the countryside. Uh, the uh, post Tet uh, uh, problems, the post Tet defeats, basically had been overcome by now, and the situation was starting to look much as it had prior to Tet. Uh, Despite that, linebacker continued for seven months. The United States in that seven-month period flew over 42,000 sorties, 6,000 sorties a month, 200 a day, and dropped over 155,000 tons of bombs on basically everything in North Vietnam, storage facilities, air bases, power plants, bridges, tunnels, hospitals, and homes. I just read a really interesting article, uh, uh, kind of new research based on interviews in a Vietnamese village, which talks about the way that the Vietnamese villagers actually responded. They had about a 15-minute warning through, uh, well, they could hear the noise, B-52s aren't quiet, and then they would have an advanced uh, uh, warning system. And these people have 15 minutes to get into the tunnels, to round up the kids, to get, you know, some valuables and head into the tunnels, or to, they created these almost kind of TP-like structures, which were actually fairly resistant to the bombings. Uh, but it's really, you know, powerful that, you know, boom, you hear this noise and you know that in 15 minutes a B-52 is going to be blowing your village apart. Um, I mean, these things cr leave craters 40 to 50 feet in, in diameter. Um, so American prospects in Vietnam are still shaky by 72, but at home there's still a great deal of resistance to the war. And this is kind of where we're going to go back a little bit. Um, uh, you may not have a, the, the two most... Uh, powerful, uh, intense, uh, violent, clearly anti-war demonstrations were um, Chicago 68 and Kent. Those were atypical. The most typical anti-war demonstration, as I said before, tended to be fairly mainstream and include people from all walks of life cut across race and gender and class lines. Uh, and that was clearly the case in 1969. Uh, Nixon's escalation under the guise of Vietnamization really prompted millions of Americans to protest against the war. And um, at the same time, the peace movement, or the anti-war movement, changed significantly too. Um, by 1969, many of the kind of more militant activists had splintered off from the movement. SDS, for instance, had fallen apart, more or less, and a more radical group calling themselves the Weathermen uh, had returned to Chicago for something called Days of Rage, where they got involved with these basically pitch battles with Chicago cops and, you know, beat each other up. Um, uh, in 1970, after Kent State, you had the same kind of, kind of fiery, uh, violent demonstration. But these were not typical. Uh, against, while, while Nixon was in power, the movement against the war actually broadened. It included a kind of a more mainstream group of Americans, clergymen, ministers, businessmen, housewives, high school students, uh, and others, including a people on college campuses who are writing columns suggesting that uh, Richard Nixon oh, suffer yeah. public, public humiliation. <laughs> um, the two best examples of this were in, in uh, the fall of 1969. Uh, in 1969, the National Moratorium Day uh, was called on October 15th, and a month later, on November 15th, the new mobilization to end the war, better known as the MOBE, uh, 
was held. So it's the moratorium and the MOBE. Um, over a million people uh, participated in the moratorium. Um, in Boston, over 100,000 uh, people appeared to protest the war. In Manhattan, uh, uh, local officials and Woody Allen and Shirley MacLaine and Stacey Keach and the typical kind of Hollywood celebrity type showed up uh, to uh, protest against the war. Uh, probably the most powerful, the most poignant demonstrations, however, took place in Washington, uh, D.C. and um, I'll talk about those in a minute because I see the yellow light flashing. And um, the spirit of Richard Nixon is whispering in my ear, telling me to be quiet. 